Hey, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History. So I've studied classics and Egyptology. And today I have an exciting video because usually it's just us. It's a cute little moment between just us. However, today I am not talking into the avoid. I actually have somebody with me. Today we are joined by my fantastic friend Raven from Dig It With Raven and we are going to be talking about her new book called The Other Ancient Civilizations and I cannot wait for you guys to hear these sneak peeks of it and to buy the book eventually when it comes out because it is amazing like I love it you guys are gonna love it so let's get into it. Hey how are you? Hey Kelsey I'm so good how are you today? I'm good! I'm so excited to talk about this book. Like, when I started reading it, obviously I knew you're an amazing academic, you are a fantastic content creator, but to see how good a writer you were for this kind of thing, I was like, how, how is she doing it all? How, how is this fair? So, but for anybody on my channel that doesn't know Raven, first of all, how do we not know Raven? Sort yourself out. But would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. First, thank you so much for the very kind words. Don't make me cry early this early <laughs> on in the chat. Um, I just can say there was a lot of tears involved. So that's how you you can't have it all. You just cry a lot, but it's fine. Yes. Hi, I'm Raven. I am a archaeologist, art conservator youtuber person who wears a lot of different hats apparently <laughs> and yeah i started a youtube channel called dig it with raven i must be like eight years ago now i'm aging myself here but uh it's been a bit of a whirlwind ever since and i've been able to meet some amazing people like kelsey through this you know online world that we have it's a little bit wild and because of that as well i've now been able to write my first book, which is something I never thought I would say. Um, and it's coming out later this year, which is very exciting. Exciting. Can't wait. Yeah, I was thinking about like when we actually met. I don't even think it was that long ago. For some reason, I feel like we've been friends for ages, but I think it might be less than a year. Yeah, because we had like, it was like a Sunday roast, like sometime earlier this year. But it's one of those things where- <gasps> Oh, is that when we met? Yeah. Yeah. And for anybody that doesn't know, we technically used to work together at the Natural History Museum. So we got our cute little lunch dates as well, which was nice. That was cute. It's too bad we didn't know earlier. or we would Because we've been following each other for years and Alton's like, oh, wait, you. Oh, my God, I know you. And I, I know. Well, it's always it's always through Erica, obviously, of Moan Inc., who's amazing. We should go follow. Um, just puts you in contact with people where you realize, oh, I've been following them for a while, but I didn't know who they were <laughs> yeah it's amazing so as you're saying you've got many different hats this is what i mean you have so many strings to your bow it's insane so with the book could you summarize it in a few words what people are going to be reading about so um we'll start with the title it's called the other ancient civilizations decoding archaeology's less celebrated cultures and the aim of the book is it's 20 chapters. Each chapter goes into a different, lesser known, I would say, ancient civilization or archaeological culture. So the aim was to sort of highlight all of the, well, not all of it because it's only 20, but as many as I could fit in a book of these cultures and civilizations that they don't get the same amount of screen time they don't get the same amount of attention or love that i think that they deserve in comparison to you know ancient egypt greece rome the big three mesopotamia everything is also very mediterranean based when we're looking at the ancient world but there's so much that people you know that because of what we're always pushed in the mainstream media and you know marketing and popularity so much gets overlooked and i feel like it's also a lot of you know older like colonial views of history that we you know don't you know don't immediately go oh yes this is my colonial view of history but it's just like what you know what we're uh, exposed to in society mm -hmm. and so it's sort of an invitation to look beyond thou those parts of the ancient world and kind of open your eyes to what 
other people were doing all over the world at different points in history. Um, some of them might be ones that you've already heard of, but I feel, I guarantee you there's at least one or two in there that you've not heard of yet and that you get to kind of de delve into a little bit. They're not, you know, huge chapters, but they're nice deep dives and they give you that jumping off point, that starting point to then learn more and to just open your eyes to all of the amazing ancient cultures that, you know, arose up all around the world. Amazing. So literally even you said there's going to be some that you don't know. When I opened it and looked at the chapter titles, I was shocked at how many civilizations there were, where I was like, I've never heard of this. I was always embarrassed. I was like, how have I gone through <laughs> the whole education system? And there's people that I have not heard of. So my follow up kind of question is, why do you think this is the case? Why are some of these things just not being spotlighted? Well, that's a good question. I think a lot of the the main reason is obviously the preservation bias in the archaeological record, right? We have so many things from ancient Egypt because of the really great preservation that we have, you know, the, the environment in which Egypt is in, it's very dry, it's very arid. So a lot of stuff can get preserved quite easily. It's like, you know, you find a lot, especially back in the early, you know, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, you found everyone was finding so much. Egyptomania was going crazy. So there's that bit where, you know, we can know a lot, even though we don't really know that much, but we know, quote unquote, a lot about certain ancient civilizations based off of what we're able to find. Mm -hmm. But then also because they haven't been given attention from previous scholarship. You know, everyone wants, especially back in the day with the antiquarians, you're looking for big giant sculptures you're looking for things gilded in gold mysterious things things that are also maybe like a little bit on your doorstep think about Greece mm -hmm. and Rome they do kind of have that accessibility that's right there they have those previous um like legacies of thought and how a lot of our world works and how a lot of people who were deciding how our world works were looking into mm -hmm. Like, oh, you know what? This is the way these people did it. We're going to emulate these people and then bring that in. So it, they're, they're, those are the ones that have always sort of been shoved down our throats and always kind of been around. We're seeing a lot of, you know, architecture hearkening back to Greece and Rome. And then, you know, for other things as well, I it's that the media frenzy, you know, King Tut, the curse of the mummy. Everyone wants those big, shiny, exciting things. And not everybody, because again, the way that we portray it, not everybody's going to look at a piece of pottery or a little sculpture or something and go, you know what? Those people are really cool. I want to learn more about it. They don't mm -hmm. sell movie tickets. They don't, you know, the documentaries don't go there. Um, and then a lot of it as well, I would say another reason <laughs> is a lot of the scholarship for a lot of these people is not in English. There's not a lot of funding for that, right, as well. If you're, everyone wants to go to the big, exciting places where you get the funding. A lot of places you don't get as much funding. A lot of it is, you know, not so much of a of an interest to English-speaking societies. So I think that, you know, if you go to South America, for example, the people, are, people in Peru are obviously going to know about the moche. But yeah. maybe someone who's in North America, England, they may not know about the moche as, as easily. So again, it's that's that just from my perspective, from our point of view, how we are raised within that historical society or with our education about history of the world, we do miss out on quite a bit. And so yes. I was the same with me when I was trying to look look them up. I had a list of like 50 and I was like, I don't know half of these. <laughs> and I felt like ashamed. I was like, I need to give these like, these ones they're due and it was you know very difficult to find sources for a lot that were in English and sometimes I'm just google translating in Spanish and hoping for the best or and I know that you know like it's one of those things where if you want to go deeper you're gonna have to like really expand and put the effort in um, but they are out there and I really wanted to just help bring those to light yeah and I love it sounds like you committed to such like a thorough process to make sure that these stories are being told as truthfully as you can, obviously, with somebody who isn't representing all of these backgrounds, but you're trying to give them this spotlight that they deserve. 
What I would ask, so a lot of the people that know me from my channel are going to be people that care about ancient Greece, Rome and Egypt, which are, as you said, the main big three that everybody knows about and what I studied, so it's what I really know about. Say they are still stuck in their ways and they're like, you know what, no, I only want to know Rome, Greece and Egypt. What kind, what sections of this book could you offer these people to try and convert them to learn a little bit more? Oh, I have something for you. <laughs> Was that oh, one? Okay. Is it SNL? Was it like Stefan? Like, I know exactly the chapters or whatever he says when they're going to the club. Um, you love ancient Greece? I've got the Minoans. If you love ancient Rome? I've got the Etruscans. Ancient Egypt? I've got the Nubians. Um, but that's sort of like what you can sort of get from the book within that like the Minoans the Etruscans especially mm -hmm. and the kingdom of Kush because everyone you know it's, it's changing now thankfully but especially with the Nubians they were always sort of like that chapter in Egyptian archaeology that you kind of learn of like oh this one time the Nubians took over for a dynasty and mm -hmm. then they away, or they're a trading partner but they are amazing they have more pyramids than Egypt right now yeah so like guys you're sleeping on the Nubians. They're pretty cool. <laughs> I love that as a little phrase. You're sleeping on the Nubians. Gosh, no. even like the, the female queens in Nubia, the Kandakis or the Candaces, especially the one that like lopped off Augustus's hatch statue head and then like buried it under a temple. Oh my God. Could you tell us any more about that as a little teaser? It's actually in the British Museum, this piece. And I have a video about it coming out soon because it's such a cool object. So... There's, uh, you know, of course, when Augustus comes to power, he's Mr. Propaganda 101. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he ends up putting up statues because, again, the emperor can't be everywhere at once. But throughout <laughs> all the provinces, he puts up all these statues of himself, of course, in his prima porte pose with his yeah. <laughs> face and his little boyish hair. So he puts them all up over the, especially on the outskirts of the provinces and of the empire. Well, guess who's there? The Nubians, especially at the bottom of Egypt after they take over Egypt. Then, you know, they try to encroach and the Nubians like, mm -mm. this one queen named Amenarenus, uh, she is amazing, this Kandakis, they start like leading these little rebellions around there. And a lot of those statues get toppled or taken or, you know, just exploited and melted down as like, you know, a little bit of rebellions against mm -hmm. Roman rule. They're like, mm -hmm. listen, we, the Egyptians tried this on us. We didn't like it very much, <laughs> you know? So uh, one of the Roman military people, I'm not a Roman person, I always forget his name, but um, he's one of the generals. Okay. And he like they negotiate you know the return of a lot of these statues and whatnot and they're like all right fine you can like stay where you are but she keeps one head and it's like completely severed she then puts it face like lying face down in a temple like under the staircase going down into the temple so yeah. that everyone who walks in is now treading over the head of the roman empire i'm obsessed <laughs> amazing she's like it's love head we love this yeah yeah stop that's a, okay so that's so interesting because i remember at university we studied that statue head of augustus because obviously it's such an amazing find but we were never told that side of the story we were told the fine location but nobody ever talks about okay why is that location significant oh god oh my god yeah very it's amazing it's so cool and it's also you know especially back in the day when statues meant so much right this these these power symbols of yeah. like i'm a representation of the statue is a representation of the roman empire of the emperor you know i'm larger than life i'm looking down on you i'm you know i'm reminding you all that especially with the eyes especially you know yes. i was always watching the really like inlaid glass eyes and then she's like, yeah, okay, you watch this. And then takes it and brings it back as a symbol of rebellion. And it never, it's never taught that way. Even the 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 little card at the British Museum. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Okay, this makes me want to go and research her more. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Honestly, these female rulers in Nubia were so cool. 
And yeah, that's exactly, it's again, it's how people have always shaped stories of history by sort of, and then also you're not being told the full story all the time. It's always however people want to shape that story for their yeah. own benefit. Yeah. That's amazing. But I love that in your book as well, you have these more grand political gestures, which you're talking about, but also there's a phrase that I love that you use. It's the magic of the mundane. I think that's a fantastic way to think and study history, but I wondered if you could give us maybe like your favorite example of this mundane find that is just shedding so much light on an individual. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yes. So the, and another big thing I wanted to do with this book is not just highlight the rulers and the, this happenstance and this war and that war, like sometimes that's how you have to tell the story of a culture yeah. or civilization because that's the information that we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, but wherever I could, I really wanted to highlight what the everyday people like you and I were doing, where we were living, all these little things that archaeologists find really interesting, but they never make it to the documentaries, right? <laughs> They never get the big shiny exposition of like, wow, look at this pottery. We can tell so much from this one little weird pot. Like no one does that. I feel like we should, but no one does because no one's going to turn in. And I get it. You know, people need to make money. But I really wanted to show how you and I, people like you and I would have lived because then you can get a little bit more of a closer connection to the ancient world. And you can understand that like we haven't changed much in the last, you know, 5,000 years. We're still the same. <laughs> We just have better technology, even then. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> with some of the tech. Oh, but I need to think of a, a good one. One of my favorite pieces were when I when I was writing the book, something that really stuck out for me. One of my favorite ones that that was that was new was the mm -hmm. Marjuara. And they are from a little island. It's a pretty big island, actually, but it's you know comparison um it's a big island that kind of is at the mouth of the amazon river in brazil called marajo island and they lived on mounds in this island they like made these huge mounds because the island flooded so they were like no no don't worry we're still gonna live here <laughs> we're just gonna make sure that we live above the mount, the, above the floodplain, like not everybody, but most, you know, a lot of there were these big mounds and you could like get around by canoe. And I thought that was really cute, like little islands on islands. Mm -hmm. And there were these, there's a few things that I thought were really cool that no one really, first of all, no one ever talks about the Marishwara, like they're really cool. Um, but in the Marishwara, they had the most, I guess, quote unquote mundane thing are these things called tangas. And they're little triangular like pieces of pottery, like like that, but they're like custom made for the wearer. They are like pubic coverings for females. Okay. So they're like decorated as well. They had really nice pottery, the Marjuara, and they had like beautiful like burial urns with like women with like scorpion eyes and like these just stunning pieces um a lot of them were like phallic shaped and as well it was quite interesting like there's a lot of fun um there's a lot of fun things that you're like wow this is like something I've never thought about and then but these ta these tangas they had like two little holes um in the top bits in the top corners okay. you wear it and that's how it was worn and what you could tell from some of them is that some of like some of them are just normal run of the mill every day your everyday tanga for example mm -hmm. And then some of them were like beautifully painted with these like red and white patterns of like intricate, like swirling, geometric, just amazing, complicated patterns. And some of them were like, well, these are like ceremonial ones. These were given to you when you got married, for example, or something. And it's a, a look into the world of women, which is something that because again, just the way history has has presented itself and devolved and evolves mm -hmm. um that we don't really get a lot of those looks into women's artifacts and items and what they would use and so seeing these as like specifically female 
artifacts and items that would have held significance to them based off of milestones within their life. That's so cool. And I just, I love how it's just like girly pop kind of vibe. It's like, you know what? I'm going to decorate it. Like, I love that. Kind of like an really? old timey vajazzle. <laughs> like, yeah. Imagine like a mom, like making your special one for like a big rite of passage. It could be your wedding. It could be your coming of age. Like, you know, your first period or something. And then you like get like a special tango, like you're a woman now, or you're going through this stage in your life and it means something and it's special. And then you can like wear it loud and proud. And I think that's really great. I love that. That's so great. And then I think also the way I love that when you, you talk about these kind of what we would call mundane things, but the way that you write your chapters as well is they start with a piece of almost fiction to like bring you in about and learn about these individuals in a way like you're reading a book and then go into the history. And like, I haven't seen that done before, but it's such an interesting way, like you were saying, to kind of create this connection between us and them and I just thought it was amazing and if there were any whether the ones you've included in the book that you want to share or something that you thought about that didn't make it to the book if you could give us a little sneak peek to the kind of story okay yes I loved writing those stories they were really scary a little difficult um because I don't write fiction <laughs> and so getting into that bit was a little bit spooky scary for me but I um I really tried to do it justice and you know they range a lot from actual people's names like if I was able to find someone's name within history I really wanted to kind of highlight them um like an Edwana which is the first female author mm -hmm. or like actually the first like credited author of all time um I think my favorite one that I got to write which sounds Maybe not, like, it wouldn't be everyone's favorite, but I really loved writing the Indus Valley civilization story where it goes into um, this gentleman. So the Indus Valley, they were really great with their plumbing and their water management and their hygiene. They had, like, showers. They had the first toilets. Like, they had a lot of, they they loved, like, running water and they loved just keeping the big cities because they had big cities nice and clean. So they mm -hmm. had these sewer systems. And in the main streets, there were actually like bits that you could take out of the street, like a grate or like a brick or a piece of wood that you could go in and like clean the, the sewer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, <laughs> I wrote that story from the perspective of one of the people who was in charge of cleaning the sewer. And we know that these were menu like frequently maintained because we found like little sand piles and dirt piles on the sides of them. Um, so we know that this was someone's job. And I thought it was just like, you know what? Yeah, this is a normal job that people have. And I thought it was really fun to just go, yeah, okay, we have a we have a sewer blockage. We have a blockage in the pipe. How are we going to solve this? And so we have him like sticking his head into the thing, trying to like, and then we found sticks and things that they used to like clear clean it out. So he's trying to do it and he's talking to himself. It's really early in the morning and he doesn't want to embarrass himself in front of everyone. His like heads half in the sewer and his butt sticking out. And he finds the problem and he's really proud of himself, right? He takes out the gunk, the old clay and the sticks, and he puts it in his pot on his thing. And he's bringing it outside the city to, to put in the dumps, right? And then he's like, he's like, I can't wait to get home and just have a shower because my head was just in a, you know, a sewer and I've been doing this all morning. And I guess that my one of my favorite, especially with that magic in the mundane too, because you'd be like, you know what? That's so relatable. And yeah, yeah and people you know, deal with the same problems that we've dealt with. And that was thousands and thousands of years ago. It's amazing. Yeah, the way you created those connections and you feel like, in a way, like empathy for these characters, like the, anybody else that you'd meet in the normal life. It's fantastic. But anyway, I am not going to steal any more of your time because I know you're really, really, really busy. Um, and I would literally sit here all day picking your brain because every civilization that you talk about is so so interesting and the stories that you present are fantastic so to finish it i would ask if you saw somebody in a bookshop waterstones and they're in the history section looking around what would you tell them about your book to make them pick that one up over anything else right now god i'm like please it took me so long <laughs> 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 You'd be like, I'd, I'd probably just show them this. Be like, do you see what I've done? The folder. <laughs> <laughs> the 
is my giant binder of research. Um, and I, because we don't have the physical copy of the book yet, I thought I'd bring this out for you to be like, look, I did the work. It's a legit book. Um, I just carry it's that around. Insane. <laughs> to water stones with me I think if I like threw it at someone at the right angle it would definitely cause some damage um, it's very heavy <laughs> guarding it with my life it got wet once it was really scary um what would I say to water stones people or in the bookstore I would say you know what if you are into ancient history but you're trying to maybe expand your boundaries and your you know your knowledge not just not completely like a deep dive into something but it's like if you're thinking about what else could be out there and what you might be missing from history I would say pick up this book and be like have a little look go time traveling around the world and just have fun and just realize like oh actually you know it, it's more than what you think if you want to change your mind about what you think about history i would say take take pick out this book because you'll realize that there's huge corners of the world that the general public don't even think about when it comes to history and ancient history and there's so much you can learn just from you know looking out your front doorstep every so often that's that's perfect summary i love that well, amazing. Thank you so much for joining me on my channel and talking about your book. Don't forget to follow myself and Raymond on social media so that you know when the book is going to be released and any other updates. I think that's everything. So have a lovely rest of your day. Bye. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe because that'll really help me out. Also, obviously go check out Raven's pages so that you can get all of the updates that you need on the book. So I'll see you next time. Bye.